David Saperstein played an instrumental role in ensuring that the United States government made the correct decision and declared what is happening in Iraq and Syria as genocide. I'm pr I was proud to support him for the position he now serves with such distinction, and I'm proud to call him friend. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the U.S. Ambassador for International Religious Freedom, the Honorable David Saperstein. Well, it's uh, an honor to hold this position, Tom, and it's an uh, honor to be here to address this uh, distinguished um, group of uh, leaders. Um, I will say in the entire work, since I have been part of it from the beginning, the three constants in all of my work have been Tom Farr, Frank Wolf, and Chris Smith. Um, I hear two of whom are here today, and they're both great heroes in the cause for religious freedom. So thank you for what you do. Um, and I want to thank the Religious Freedom Project at the Berkeley Center for co-sponsoring co this meeting today and part of our ongoing and productive partnership with you, Tom, and with uh, RFP. Um, the project does serious work, and today we are talking about the most serious of topics. So your excellencies, your graces, fellow ambassadors, ladies, gentlemen, and I can say with a great deal of pride, a lot of friends in this room. I am deeply honored to be here. Many of you have risked your lives to help victims of Daesh violence, while many others have spent your lives fighting against the hateful ideologies of intolerance that fuel Daesh's rise, which you have done amongst varied vital ways by forging interreligious coalitions to promote human rights, tolerance, and inclusiveness, and peace, both here in the United States and across the globe, and in the Near East. And too many of you are victims of Daesh or groups like it. As we all know, on March 17th, Secretary of State John Kerry, who cares about this issue deeply, made the historic announcement that in his judgment, Daesh, and I'm quoting now, Daesh is responsible for genocide against groups in areas under its control, including Yazidis, Christians, and Shia Muslims. He said that Daesh is, quote, also responsible for crimes against humanity and ethnic cleansing directed at these same groups and in some cases against Sunni Muslims, Kurds, other minorities. And he put it plainly when he said, Daesh is genocidal by self-proclamation, by ideology, and by actions in what it says, what it believes, what it does. The fact is that Daesh kills Christians because they are Christians, Yazidis because they are Yazidis, Shia because they are Shia. In a report to Congress, we deserveedly describe Daesh's abuses in the starkest terms we could. Not a terribly difficult task, given the heinous atrocities Daesh continues to perpetrate against so many. Amongst those we named were unlawful forced displacement, forced religious conversions, slavery, kidnapping, trafficking, sexual violence, resulting in wide-scale fatalities and injuries. Victims, including women and children, come from across the spectrum of ethnic and religious groups, including Yazidis, Sunni Muslims, Shia Muslims, Christians, Turkmen, Shabbat, Kakai, Sabian Mandeans, among others. Daesh has used public beheadings and other forms of summary executions, kidnapping, rape, forced marriage, and sexual slavery, employed child soldiers from amongst its own recruits, as well as captured children. Daesh also continues to attack places of worship, schools, and public spaces. This assessment along with statements by the U.S. House of Representatives, European Parliament, the Council of Europe, Parliamentary Assembly, and others, has helped fo focus global attention on the plight of religious and ethnic minorities under Daesh. But these must become more than just statements. There must be actions to 
to implement the goals that all of us share in common. Secretary Kerry, in his statement, challenged the world to, quote, find the resources to help those harmed by those, these atrocities. And last week's pledging conference, and this conference of the delegations from 30 countries and international organizations gathered today and then in a closed meeting tomorrow, are focused on producing those financial, political, and programmatic resources. So at the conference last week, an additional $590 million was pledged for humanitarian assistance, $350 million pledged for critical uh, stabilization efforts. Under the new UN program, the financial facility for immediate stabilization, 125 million pledge. And for the new program that is the midterm program, the, uh, the mid-length program um, uh, here, the uh, financial facility uh, for expanded stabilization, the United States began the pledging with $50 million of its own, with many others promising that they would come back with the pledges from their country. And 200 million already pledged for 2017, 2018, and much more to come. 80 million just for the demining that is so vital. So we are convening these meetings today and tomorrow to try to answer that call, to find ways to better assist religious and ethnic minorities in Iraq and Syria. And what we are learning from the conversations we've already had and the rich conversations that are promised in the rest of the afternoon here will be vital to our deliberations tomorrow. We are deeply appreciative. I, I have to say, Tom, where is Tom? He's right here. I have to say, Tom, that uh, you folks do great conferences. This really has been one of the most fascinating, rich, and fruitful conversations that I've been part of. And I really, I really want to thank you for the extraordinary effort um, that you have done. Um, as a State Department Special Advisor for Religious Minorities in the Near East and South Central Asia, Knox Thames explained uh, early this morning, our effort is in partnership with France, uh, Spain, and Jordan as a follow-up to the French-led um, uh, initiative uh, by uh, former Foreign Minister Laurent Fabius. To be clear, while we are deeply concerned about all who have suffered under Daesh's reign of terror, at the same time as this conference represents, we recognize a particular existential threat that Daesh presents to minority communities. We have seen such forces at work in Iraq. The Yazidi Christian and uh, and some of the Shia communities are under enormous pressures to survive under Daesh's genocidal efforts. Iraq's once vibrant Jewish, Shabak, Kakai, um, Sabian, Mandean communities struggle daily under the uh, Daesh's efforts at ethnic cleansing, some virtually extinct in their homeland. <clears throat> so we gather to fight for religious freedom for all. We strongly present and support religious freedom, not only because it is a core, basic, fundamental, universal human right, but also because respect for religious freedom is instrumental to peace, security, and development around the world. No nation can fulfill its potential if its people are denied the right to exercise their freedom of religion or belief, nor can it have the stability that is a sine qua non for peace, prosperity, for advancement, for strong democracy if the nation is riven by sectarian divisions, sectarian violence, and if members of some group simply because of their religious identity or practices are declared functionally or by law to be second class citizens. All that does is drive religious life underground, resulting in frustration, despair, and anger, providing fertile ground in which seeds of violent extremism can be sowed and followers recruited and supported. And furthermore, as this conference illustrates, just looking around the room and listening to the diverse views from the questions and comments from the floor, this gathering testifies to the power of what happens when people of different backgrounds, different perspectives, different identities come together with a common purpose. As the richness of America's contribution 
to the world. This nation that sociologists tell us embodies 2,000 different religions, denominations, faith groups, sects all across America. And our ability to live together in comedy and to forge common interfaith approaches to the problems that face us is a rich model for others. But we do so not just by its effectiveness, because of the fundamental reality that in any country, in any society, if any group can be persecuted, then all are endangered. There cannot be safety and security for the religious freedoms of some groups if others are denied. And that requires sometimes compromises of how to proceed together, finding common ground, even amongst our differences. Now, tragically, Daesh and other violent extremist groups in Iraq and Syria continue to target members of religious and ethnic minorities with violence. Women from all communities in Daesh-occupied areas are subject to severe restrictions on freedom of movement, employment, and dress, often trapped indoors out of fear for personal safety. Sunni Muslims who disagree with these terrorists' extremist religious interpretations to justify their bloodthirsty power-seeking have also suffered barbaric violence. Throughout the areas controlled by Daesh, religious, cultural, and historical sites affiliated with people of many faiths and cultures have been systematically looted and destroyed. The latter abuses lead to Daesh selling priceless antiquities to restock their coffers. In response, we are pursuing multiple efforts to assist minority communities, including documentation of atrocities, support for efforts aimed at accountability for perpetrators of this unlawful violence, services for survivors of gender-based violence, preservation of cultural heritage, and inclusive peace building. We want to help recreate the conditions where religious and ethnic minorities feel confident in their future in Iraq and Syria. Our vision is of a sovereign, united Iraq in which these historic communities can remain in and return to their ancestral homes in safety, dignity, and prosperity. And so to our vision, is for a Syria that is democratic, non-sectarian, and pluralistic. That is the goal. And knowing that the demands on the government of Iraq and the international community are still far greater than the resources currently available, what are we doing to achieve that goal? What progress is being made? So let me list some of the answers to that question. First and foremost, Daesh must be defeated. In the efforts of the government of Iraq, vetted opposition forces in Syria, together with the 67-member counter-ISIL coalition, are conducting a robust campaign of coordinated airstrikes, military training and assistance, diplomatic engagement and cooperation, and messaging coordination to degrade, delegitimize, and defeat Daesh. The coalition has conducted more than 14,000 airstrikes against Daesh in Iraq and Syria, eliminating thousands of its fighters, cutting off key communications hubs and transit routes, significantly weakening Daesh's finances. So for example, Daesh's production of oil has declined by about 30%. Indeed, their ability to generate revenue in general in the areas under their control has been reduced by at least that much. Strikes on cash storage sites have destroyed tens of millions of Daesh's cash. We've also worked to cut off the illicit sale of antiquities. Due to the increasing financial pressure, Daesh has reportedly cut its fighters' pay by half in some areas, turn to increasingly arbitrary taxation and extortion rackets to raise funds further undermining its credibility and increasing desertions. Efforts to support Iraqi forces' military advancement on the ground have resulted in Daesh being pushed out from nearly half of the territory it once held in Iraq, about 20% of what it held earlier in Syria. We have brought military power to bear to assist religious minorities directly as well. Two examples that most of you know stand out are airstrikes in August 2014 to relieve the siege on Mount Sinjar that saved the lives of thousands of Yazidis 
and the airstrikes in March 2015 that enabled a Syrian and, and Syrian Kurdish defense forces to reverse a dash advance in the Kaaba River Valley in Syria that threatened predominantly a Syrian Christian villages. Dangers still exist, as all of us know. We've seen it even recently with the multiple attacks in Kamishli, Syria, the most recent in June, targeted Patriarch Ignatius Afram uh, II, the head of the Syriac Orthodox Church, and Mara from Athaniel, um, the Assyrian Church of the East Bishop in Hasaka, on the commemoration of an atrocity committed 100 years ago. The attack on the clergy was thankfully unsuccessful, but tragically three guards were killed. And in general, too many are still suffering. Yazidi women and children still held in captivity. Millions of our IDPs between the two countries displaced in their homes, mourning the lives of their, the loss of their loved ones because of Daesh's reign of terror. But we are making progress at defeating Daesh and pushing them out liberating te territories, mostly Yazidi and Muslim um, uh, majority areas, but we look forward in the, for the future liberation of lands belonging to Christians and other indigenous communities, and that day is approaching. Second, even while we need to secure their rights and opportunities, we must stabilize the condition of members of displaced communities whom we are asking to wait until they can safely return. Until then, they need stability, a quality of life, a feeling of personal security that provides them with the willingness to remain in the country and to return to their homes when they decide to do so. We need to help ensure that their kids have schools to go to, jobs when they graduate, and their economic opportunities for families. We are engaged in efforts to ensure that those who survive Dash's abuse and captivity are provided support including psychological and health services that they need to recover their resilience, as well as the livelihood opportunities to support their families and their selves to rebuild their lives. We are taking action now through the Gender-Based Violence Emergency Response and Protection Initiative, which provides funds for immediate medical, psychological, and social support to survivors of gender-based violence, including those subjected to Dasha's brutal treatment. But we acknowledge that these services may not yet have reached the victims in a number of areas, and we're trying all the time to support NGOs that are involved in providing these services in much wider areas. This fund is a public-private partnership that can accept contributions from other countries. We're also providing support for implementation of Iraq's National Action Plan on Women, Peace, and Security. And one more example, the United States provided $18 million in fiscal year 2015, continuing this year, to the International Organization for Migration, the IOM, in Iraq, to provide livelihood support for vulnerable displaced Iraqis, conduct rapid response and assessments of newly displaced population, complete community-led programs designed to reduce tensions and enhance integration through its community revitalization program. And I think most of you know the challenges that the displaced communities face in terms of the provision of schools for their kids. And as part of this program, IOM has been able to expand and renovate seven primary and secondary schools throughout the Iraqi Kurdistan region, which will, um, which uh, will allow thousands of IDP and host community children access to an education. This is an important start. Much more needs to be done in this regard. Now, obviously, the liberation of Mosul will produce enormous new challenges. This was addressed a couple of times in our earlier conversation through um, uh, and that challenge, those challenges must be addressed in the planning uh, that is taking place along with the military planning. Throughout the region, NGOs, humanitarian organizations will need rapid, safe, unhindered access to populations in need, but especially in Iraq and the Kurdish regions. As UNDP deputy for Iraq, Lise Grand has reported, the campaign to free Mosul from ISIL control 
could adversely affect well over a million people in the, in the short term. And this would make it one of the largest humanitarian crises of recent times. The Kurdistan regional government already hosts to more than a million IDPs, released its plan to support five new IDP camps supported by the international community that can house up to 420,000 people. The UNHCR is seeking funding now and anticipates it will work with the KRG to build them. They need sufficient resources for all these efforts because, as you know, up until July 20th, just last week, only 41% of humanitarian needs identified by the UN's 2016 Iraq Humanitarian Response Plan were funded as of that day. So we convened the pledging conference for Iraq last week here in Washington and are following up with this conference, focus on restoration of the liberated communities. As I noted last week, as I noted earlier last week, our international partners pledge over $2 billion for humanitarian efforts, demining, stabilization, which will help meet the needs of the millions of Iraqis who have been displaced or otherwise affected by ISIL violence. Including our contribution that we announced last week, the United States has provided more than 914 million in humanitarian assistance for vulnerable Iraqis in Iraq and in the region since October 2013. In addition, we have contributed more than 5.1 billion for conflict-affected Syrians since the start of the crisis, including more than 2.8 billion inside Syria alone to provide emergency food assistance, cash assistance for emergency needs, funding for shelters, much-needed counseling and protection programs to the most vulnerable, including children, women, persons with disabilities, and the elderly. The result of these conferences will play an essential role in closing the gaps between the needs and the resources in Iraq. Third, the areas liberated from Daesh must be stabilized, providing security on which returning residents of all religions and ethnicities can rely. The coalition has trained more than 31,000 Iraqi security forces undertaking an extensive police training mission in Iraq under Italian leadership to secure the areas liberated from Daesh and to guarantee the safety and security of displaced populations returning to their homes. We are seeking to expand this training program and ask for other coalition partners who contribute to this effort. We've also begun training defense uh, forces for minority communities, specifically Yazidis and Christians so far, which will be integrated into the Peshmerga and or other GOI forces. Fourth, minorities need to feel they have a greater voice in their governance. Respect for the human rights and fundamental freedoms, including freedom of religion for um, all religious groups is critical. So is the provision of equal citizenship and equal access to justice. Take just one small but important example, which a number of you worked on. Iraq has suspended religiously divisive changes in the identification card law, and those changes should not be revisited. More broadly, the United States supports arrangements wherein minorities have greater voice over how their communities are governed within a federal governance framework. You are doing this work, and we applaud you. The Alliance of Ar Iraqi Minorities, AIM, one of the shining lights of human rights and good governance advocacy in Iraq, worked with the Minority Caucus in the Council of Representatives to add language beginning in the 2012 budget law to provide for a legal foundation for the equitable distribution of funds from Iraq's regional and provincial budgets. AIM then work with provincial councils and districts, sub-districts, as well as the varied indigenous communities in the Nineveh Plain to ensure those funds were used in specific public service projects such as health clinics, roads, and schools. Fifth, recovery. Members of displaced communities will not choose to return to their cities and towns if no livelihood opportunities exist there, or if the infrastructure and basic services 
remain devastated. Areas liberated from Daesh must have functioning infrastructure such as roads, electricity, sanitation, available means for people to support their families. Demining is absolutely critical if we hope uh, the different communities will return to their homes. The United States and international community are taking significant steps to continue expanding um, their support for this daunting task in ISIL liberated areas. Um, and in pursuit of addressing these financial needs, these conferences last week and this week are trying to lay out the resources that would be necessary to help in these recovery efforts. Six, it is important to promote accountability for perpetrators of atrocities on all sides. This includes atrocities perpetrated, of course, by Daesh, as well as by Shia militias affiliated with the popular mobilization forces who have committed abuses against uh, civilians after areas have been liberated from Daesh. We must also focus on the wide variety of crimes committed sexual and gender-based violence, mass killings, and accountability and transitional justice mechanisms must reflect the needs of victims and communities. One size will not fit all. To knit back together these communities, these efforts must include formal and informal forms of reconciliation and accountability. It must pursue high-level prosecutions where possible, but also address accountability at local and regional and national levels for followers and for leaders. In this effort, documentation of atrocities is crucial because it preserves information for future accountability efforts and helps to identify survivor needs and connect individuals with services. The U.S. government is currently implementing a project that enables Iraqi civil society to document violations and abuses, creates protocols and a repository for information gathered, and connects documentation efforts to local and national accountability undertakings. To date, representatives from Iraqi civil society organizations that are participating in this project have collected nearly 1,000 narratives from victims and witnesses of atrocities committed in Iraq. Many in the NGO community are contributing as well to the compilation of evidence and narratives to help in this cause. In Syria, the United States supports the Syria Justice and Accountability Center, one of the premier Syrian-led institutions heading this, leading this documentation effort. Um, SJAC works with partners and its team on the ground to collect documentation related to the conflict including interviews with former detainees that document torture and in human detention condition and works directly with survivors of sexual and gender-based violence. Another project provides support for the identification, protection, and excavation of mass graves. By collecting information about these sites, we reduce the chances of accidental or purposeful damage to them and provide important forensic information to hold Daesh accountable, especially as the government of Iraq and its partners continue to liberate territory from Daesh. In addition, we have started to use satellite imagery to look for mass graves behind Daesh front lines in Syria and Iraq. The delegations from abroad who are participating in the conference have photos of some of these satellite pictures in your packets. Seventh, relatedly to atrocity accountability, we must plan for the extraordinary tensions alluded to in our earlier conversations that will accompany the return of displaced communities to their homes and businesses that have been occupied in some cases by former neighbors, damaged or destroyed during the course of the violence. This must involve transitional justice and reconciliation efforts and other measures to prevent or minimize reprisal violence on all sides. Credible, inclusive, judicial, investigative capacity is critical to give all of those displaced hope that there will be justice. Simultaneously, religious and community leaders must take the lead in reconciliation, in peacemaking. Cycles of violence must end, and it won't happen unless all of us are committed to making that a reality even as accountability processes are pursued. 
Otherwise, there will be no peace in the end. Eighth, as part of its ethnic cleansing efforts, Daesh has eviscerated the cultural, religious, and historic heritage of the region. The secretary cited this destruction of cultural and religious heritage when he said that Daesh was responsible for crimes against humanity, but it is also a crime against history. My office has taken lead in coordinating efforts in the field, and I commend Knox teams for his leadership in this regard. And working with the Smithsonian Institution, we are working with local communities um, in Iraq to help them determine how they can best preserve their religious and cultural heritage, including by preserving churches, shrines, synagogues, mosques. In closing, I want to highlight the new opportunity that I've mentioned several times to assist minorities after liberation. The creation of the UN Development Program's funding facility for immediate stabilization, or FFIS, or the funding facility for expanded stabilization, the FFES, these funds restore essential services, provide small grants to businesses, assist local government with recovery, address small infrastructure or medium-sized infrastructure needs. That includes utilities and the general structures of the communities. Um, and support reconciliation efforts. These are the fundamental building blocks for communities to thrive. Donors have provided a pledge, pledged over 200 million from almost 20 partners, including more than 32 million pledged by the United States. UNDP has also created a similar mechanism, as I indicated, called FFES, and the difference is that focuses on the midterm assistance program, because you can't just do it for a year if there's not going to be continuity of funding. And so we're looking out several years and asking countries to participate in it. In both FFIS and FFES, we are working with the United Nations so that countries end private donors can provide funds to specific projects for assistance, which can include um, minority areas or specific sites. We hope that this will bring significant international engagement with countries feeling a sense of partnership with these local communities in restoring those communities and making return possible. And that all this will help give minorities confidence that they have a future in ancestral homelands. And that is our message to the international community. It is indispensable that we find the resources to assist all in need, no matter what their faith, no matter what their religious or ethnic identities, so that as many as possible will want to stay in their homes and feel confident in their future. So much remains to be done in order to achieve a lasting defeat of this barbaric group and to ensure that religious diversity survives. As Secretary Kerry has said, Daesh represents barbarism in its purest, most evil form. From the slaughter of minorities to the systematic oppression of women, Daesh rejects every civilized norm. But to truly defeat Daesh and its message, Nothing so vividly or effectively repudiates Dash's goals and ethnic at, at, or efforts at ethnic cleansing and genocide than to ensure the security of the very people that Dash has targeted, the protection of their human rights, and the success of our joint efforts to allow the return of Iraq and Syria's displaced populations. Your Excellencies, Your Graces, my fellow ambassadors, we aspire for all people in the region, regardless of their beliefs, to enjoy universal human rights and fundamental freedoms, including religious freedom. I am proud that we have played a lead role in responding to Daesh's atrocities and our dedication to promoting religious freedom, including the rights of members of minority groups in Iraq and Syria remains strong. But there's much work we must do together. And let's be honest. We all know, whatever we have achieved, this is a very hard undertaking. Achieving the goals and implementing the programs described above will not be an easy task. It requires creativity, vision, and tenacity if we are to achieve our goals. But that is exactly why we have cause for hope. Creativity, vision, and tenacity are not in short supply in this room. 
the powerful, growing, innovative grassroots advocacy and aid work that we have heard about today and we see manifested in this room throughout Iraq and Syria is having real results. Yazidi and Christian and Turkmen and Kurdish and yes, Sunni and Shia, Arab organizations are coming to the aid of their own and others in a spirit of selflessness and common cause, calling for an end to discrimination, persecution and conflict and calling for political inclusion and a reawakening of Iraq and Syria's historical diversity. We see the work of Father Benoka running medical clinics, of Yazda's efforts to provide health care, help survivors of gender-based violence and aid in documenting these atrocities, Baskali Ward's work in uh, human rights and governance, and we see Basim Ishak's strong advocacy for democracy and pluralism in Syria and Rajab Karim's advocacy and activism for the KK and his faith, and we have seen with the KRGs nurturing the rebirth of a small Jewish community. In the face of this catastrophe, you and so many others in this room and around the world, together with committed governments in the international community who have gathered here this month, will make the world listen and attend and respond. So I want to express my sincere gratitude for your efforts in defending pluralism in Iraq and Syria, in protecting their religious and ethnic uh, minorities, and in advocating for the enjoyment of religious freedom for all by members of populations whose voices are too often muted or ignored. Thank you all for your significant contributions to a more peaceful, tolerant, and freer Near East. It is a model the entire world needs so urgently today. Thank you.